wife all those years washing and detailing cars so they get this church going and, and keep it up and running. And I remember coming here for church services and they would, they would just drag in here. I mean, they, they were as tired as a man and a woman could be and get up here and conduct church services and lead them. And, uh, and God's really blessed. But this, this, you didn't always have this building and, and you didn't always have a full-time pastor and you didn't always have the, a lot of these nice things that you got now and it's, I know it's God's blessing but it's also because this man this woman literally worked their fingers to, to calluses and you'd shake his hand and just it'd be I'd be so embarrassed my hand all you know smooth like a preacher's hand yeah. <laughs> His hand all rough like a man's hand. I've been tempted to just carry around sandpaper with me, just rub my hand with it. Just, so I feel like such a wimp when I shake these fellows' hands. But Tim and, and Mr. Ms. Crotts, honestly, I respect you two so much. I really appreciate what you've done here. And uh, I, But I won't forget tonight, the choir fell through the floor in the old building. I, that thing in the Bible about if a fox came by and hit this thing with its tail, it'd fall down. That's, that's what that old <laughs> church building was like that, man. We'd sit out there in that prayer room or on that little stove and praise God. But some wonderful, precious memories of our time here. And then uh, most of Travis's message was a blessing. They got on that police thing. <laughs> and uh, there's one of those traps at, uh, around exit 5 in Georgia on I-95, one around exit 57, Georgia on I-95. There's one around Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, there's three of them on 75 in Georgia you get on that road. But anyway, so we're, we're going home one day from a meeting in, in Rock Hill, and I was the elect. And that, that man pulled me over and before he got to the car, my wife had explained to me the situation and why we were in, in the spot we were in. And I couldn't listen to her because I was praying. You know. God answered my prayers. That man came back. He said, your record's good. I'm just going to give you a warning this time. And I said, can I ask you a question? My wife's head just dropped. And I said, honestly, I mean, you're a nice guy. I appreciate you just giving me a warning. I said, I'm just curious. Everybody out here was speeding. How'd you pick me? And she didn't even, she never looked at him. She looked straight ahead. She said, he don't know when to shut up. <laughs> She's had to say that many times in many different situations. And he told me how they pick who to pull over when everybody's speeding. 
and I'll be at my table after the meeting, and for, for, for 20 bucks, I'll tell you what he said. <laughs> it's pretty valuable information. <laughs> All right, now that I've confessed my sin, I'm able to preach. And <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah 53 and verse number, we're going to start at 6 again and read 6 and 7 together. Isaiah 53, verses 6 and 7. All we, I don't know what a Calvinist does with that except change it. Believe the Bible alone is pretty clear. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We're not sheep, but we go astray like sheep. And what's profound about that for those of you, as we said last night, that have grown up on the farm and around livestock, chicken will find the roost. Turkey will find the roost, a goat will find a barn, the cow will wear a path to get home at night. A sheep will not find its way home if it's only got to go 100 yards. You have to go get a sheep and bring it home. It's not going to find its way home. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, which means if you're home tonight, somebody came and got you. You didn't find the Lord. You didn't find the way to heaven. Somebody came and got you. Praise the Lord. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our iniquity on him. What an amazing thing. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. I read both verses because I I, want to say one thing before I start preaching on my verse. We were like sheep in getting lost and wandering away. He was like like a sheep in humble obedience the just dying for the unjust. Like an obedient sheep, he laid down his life and died for those disobedient sheep that had wandered away. What an incredible substitutionary death. The Bible doesn't just say that he died. The Bible says he was slaughtered. The Bible doesn't just say he was put to death. The Bible says he was slaughtered. The slaughterhouse is not just where you take the life of an animal. It's where you just chop it all to pieces. Jesus Christ wasn't hung by the neck. He wasn't shot by a firing squad. He wasn't electrocuted in a chair. He was slaughtered. He didn't just die for us. He died a horrible, painful, bloody, mutilated, ripped to shreds death. That is, it's so beyond description that all you get are a few verses like this in the Old Testament and none in the New. And you have to just meditate upon what it would have been like to have a crown of thorns driven in your brow because the scripture doesn't describe it, it just states it. His back was plowed like a field and God leaves you to think on that. It doesn't go into the detail. His visage was marred more than any man. They tore his beard from his face, ripped it out by the roots and the Bible says that but leaves us to go there. And in the New Testament, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it simply says they crucified him. The Holy Spirit, it's as if in this book of life, the New Testament, we're not going to talk about his death under the curse in the Old Testament. But it's here in the Old Testament. If you want the crucifixion, you have to go to the Old Testament. If you want the horror of the cross, you have to go to the Old Testament. But tonight I, I am restricted. <laughs> I've got to stay in this one verse, and it's okay because there's plenty here. He was oppressed, 
and he was afflicted. We've been talking much about punctuation this week. Oh, what a blessing that is. He was oppressed, comma, and he was afflicted, comma. Those two phrases, one is before Calvary. The other is at Calvary. How do you know that? He was oppressed. Oppressed is burdened with unreasonable impositions. Overpowered, overburdened, depressed. The man Christ Jesus was burdened with unreasonable impositions. Something was placed upon him, thrust upon him, asked of him, required of him, that was completely unreasonable. There is, there is no reason why the creator of the heavens and the earth should have found himself living the life that he lived and dying the death that he died. It's love, it's grace, it's mercy, it's not reasonable. How about the unreasonable burden of leaving heaven to come to earth for sinners? Not, not leaving earth to go to heaven to get a crown. Not leaving earth to go to heaven to get a throne. Not leaving earth to go to heaven to get the worship and adoration of the heavenly host. He had all of that and left it. To come down here and live as a man. Surrounded by fallen men. That's an unreasonable burden. How about the unreasonable burden as was mentioned earlier of being subject to imperfect parents. Joseph's a sinner. And Jesus Christ is subject unto him. Mary is a sinner. And Jesus Christ is subject unto her. The, the, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, looked at a sinful man and said, yes, sir, whatever you say. Yes, ma'am, whatever you ask me to do. God Almighty in a body of flesh took orders from a woman. God Almighty in a body of flesh had a sinful, unsaved... What a, hang in there. Carpenter. You know how you get saved? You believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ which hadn't happened. So Joseph, just a run-of-the-mill construction worker. Come on, don't, don't just, I don't know about that. Well, what else would he be? He gets up in the morning, he goes to work, he deals with construction worker things all day long, and he comes home tired and worn out, and, and all that goes with it. And when he told Jesus to come to the table, Jesus came to the table. And when he told Jesus time for bed, Jesus went to bed. That's the one that runs the universe. How unreasonable. He was oppressed. How about the burden of working a job when you're the creator? We got millions of people in the United States figuring out every way in the world to keep from working a job. The one that buried the gold in the mountains worked a job. The one that put the silver and the diamonds in the ground worked a job. The one that filled the oil fields so men could find the oil and drive their cars worked a job. How unreasonable. Couldn't Jesus Christ have just ordered manna to fall from heaven twice a day to feed himself? Couldn't he just call up a flock of quail whenever he got tired of the bread? He did it in the Old Testament. Couldn't he have ravens bring him lunch like he sent food to Elijah? How unreasonable that the Lord of glory should be swinging a hammer, pounding nails, 
Couldn't he have come and been born the son of the high priest? Couldn't he have come and been born the son of the governor? How about the unreasonable burden of being questioned and contradicted by disciples who don't know what they're talking about? Well, here's the plan, fellas. Uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed in the hands of sinners. I'm going to die and three days rise again. And Simon Peter says, no, you're not. That's not going to happen. Next time Jesus said it, Simon Peter took God by the, by the lapels and shook him and said, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know how unreasonable that is? After three and a half years of teaching those men and what he's going to do, they're sitting in the upper room and they still don't have the slightest idea what he's going to do. And he says, now, on the way to the cross tonight, all of you are going to betray me. And one by one, they each looked at him and said, no, we're not. Not me. I won't betray you. For three and a half years, they'd heard him say, I'm the truth. I don't lie. Whatever comes out of my mouth is, is, is so. I, I, I'm God, and I'm speaking as God. And when he said, Thomas, you're going to betray me. No, sir. No, I won't. You have, you have my word on it. And he gets around to Peter, and Peter looks up and down the table, because they're all sitting on one side of the table, because it'd be hard to paint the picture if they weren't. Yeah. And the photographer said, Judas, don't smile. Yeah. And Peter looked up and down the table and said, though all men should deny you, I won't. You know what each one of them said? Jesus you don't know as much about this thing as we do. You know, what an unreasonable burden of trying to pastor, of thinking you've taught a bunch of people the truth and thinking they know the Bible and thinking you've shown them how to live the Christian life and then watching them just bomb out as though they never heard a word you said. Okay, that, I deserve that. You pastors deserve that. You Sunday school teachers deserve that. We could say, I didn't teach it well. I didn't say it right. I didn't set a good enough example. Not him. Not him. He taught it right. He said it right. He made it clear. He set the example. And they didn't seem to believe a word he said. He had to tell them, you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know why I'm here. You don't know who I am. How about the unreasonable burden of having to keep a law which God said was written to control the ungodly and the sinner? The Lord's not written for a righteous man, but for the ungodly and the sinner. You heard that in the first hour. But here Jesus Christ comes down here and he, he's not ungodly, he's God. And he's not a sinner. He's in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And yet he's the only person who ever bowed his neck and put that yoke on it and never took it off. How unreasonable that the only man who never needed to be restrained allowed himself to be so restrained. How about the only man that ever needed to be reined in allowed himself to be reined in by that, by that law? In Acts 15, the Holy Ghost says, that law was a yoke and a burden that we were not able to bear. And if you're saved, the Holy Spirit said, it's such a heavy load, we're not going to require it of you. And yet Jesus Christ came down here and put his neck in that yoke and said, Father, drive me, drive me like a wild ass. Drive me like an untamed ox. I'll go wherever you tell me to go and do whatever I tell you, whatever you tell me to do. How unreasonable that the only one who didn't need the law was the only one who lived under the law. 
How about the unreasonable burden of continual opposition from religious and political frauds? A bunch of thieving, stealing, corrupt, money-loving priests trying to frame Jesus for not paying tribute money. Men who devour widows' houses to line their pockets, criticizing Jesus for not washing his hands before lunch. Are you kidding? Every time he turned around, he's healing people, he's cleansing people, he's putting families back together, he's giving saving light to those that sit in darkness. And as soon as he turns around, here's some professor from a seminary. Here's some minister from the local church getting in his face and saying, I don't think you're doing it right. I don't think you should be doing it this way. You know what? I deserve that because even when I'm doing right, there's something I'm doing that's not right while I'm doing what's right. But not him. Not him. Here's Sadducees that have the same Bible everybody else has. They can't find life after death in 39 books of the Bible. How dumb do you have to be? They can't find angels. They can't find spirits. What are you, what are you looking at? And they're in Jesus' face telling him he's a false teacher. What an unreasonable burden. All he had to do was speak the word and every one of them dropped straight into hell quicker than Korah did. How about the unreasonable burden of paying for the sins of those who sinned against him? Well, it comes down to it. It comes down to it. Every sin we commit is against God. I'm not guilty before you. I won't stand before you in the day of judgment. I'm guilty before God and I'll stand before God because it's God I've sinned against. It's God you've sinned against. And the one who is the offended party is called upon to bear all of those offenses? That's, That's an unreasonable burden. And so I say to you that When this Bible says he was oppressed, that started the day he stepped down from the third heaven. And it lasted all the way to Pilate's judgment hall. He said, I just got so many problems. I got so many troubles. I got so many things people expect of me. I got so many ways people criticize me. But pretty much all of that we've got coming. I mean, if they find fault with me about something and, and, and I didn't really do it, there's something I did really do that they don't know about, so I kind of deserve something. Right? People say you're lazy. You might not be lazy, but you're proud. If they say you're proud, you might not be proud. Well, you are proud. People say you got a bad attitude. You might have a good attitude, but you might be a, a, you know, a tightwad. I mean, if I get criticized, they may not hit the mark, but they'll hit the target. I'm guilty of something. I I deserve some form of criticism. If I'm disrespected, I know myself well enough. You ought to know yourself well enough. I'm not all that worthy of respect. I'm not talking about our church put on self. I'm talking about what we really are self. But not Jesus. He never deserved anything but praise and rarely got it. He never deserved anything but honor and rarely got it. Just think about something. But before we get to the cross, when that mob in Jerusalem, Barabbas is standing there, Jesus is standing there, and that mob is crying, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Away with this man. Get rid of Jesus. Give us Barabbas. That mob has to be made up of people who at least had family members healed by Jesus. 
Some of those people ate the bread and fish when he fed the 5,000. Some of those people are no longer lepers. Some of them are no longer blind. Some of them can hear. Some of them, just months earlier, he loosed their tongue so they could speak, and now they're using that tongue to say, Barabbas! I mean, before he went to the cross, he's already taken it in the teeth. Before he went to the cross, his heart is being ripped out every hour of every day by the ingratitude of the human race. When that Bible tries to tell you not to get worn out with sinners, it tells you in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 3, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself that you a sinner could say something against me a sinner, that's just life. But for sinners to say something against the sinless, spotless, holy Lamb of God, how unreasonable. He was oppressed. That's not the message in the verse. And he was afflicted. Afflicted means to be affected with continued or often repeated pain, either of body or of mind, suffering grief or distress of any kind. These definitions are important. He was afflicted. He was afflicted, that is, he was in continued pain in body and mind. He was continually in distress because of the lost condition of man. The lost condition of man. Now, I I don't want to open any wounds tonight, but they're already open. Tonight in bars all over America are young men and young ladies who grew up in Christian homes and in good churches. And that bothers me, but it doesn't hurt me. If one of those children was mine, I couldn't rest. It would afflict me. There are a lot of people in prison tonight that grew up in a good Sunday school just like this one. You know that. You go preach to them. You pray for them. Use them as sermon illustrations. But if one of those was your child, you couldn't eat a meal without bowing your head and saying, God, what happened? You'd be afflicted by that. Did you know every lost sinner is someone that God cares about more than you care about your own child? You know how afflicted with pain and grief God is over every lost person in this world? He didn't start suffering when he got to the cross. He's been suffering since he had to lock the gates of Eden. All we like sheep have gone astray is a verse for us. It's a doctrine for us. It's it's an excellent sermon to preach. But if you're the good shepherd... You can't rest at night with your 99 because the one that's out there is afflicting your heart. He didn't come down here to be afflicted. He came down here because he was afflicted. He's afflicted by the hardness of the human heart. Does it bother you when you try to witness to somebody and they don't want to hear it? You didn't create them. You didn't form and fashion them after your image. You didn't at this point in time send your son to shed his blood to save them from hell. They might have told you to get off their front porch. They might have told you they don't want your piece of literature. They told God, I will tread the blood of your son under my feet. That's how little I care for it. Right. 
Wouldn't it hurt? Uh, honestly, tonight, I don't want to open a wound. But if it's there, it's already open. If God, God forbid, if you, if you gave your heart to a man and he left you for another woman, if you gave your heart to a woman and she left you for another man, you can, your friends, well, just get over it. Just take it to the Lord. You can't. And God pledged his love to every sinner on the cross at Calvary. And look at how many of them just walk away into the arms of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And don't care how they hurt God. He's afflicted. But the pain and suffering caused by sin was mentioned last night. There's Jesus standing at the grave of Lazarus. He's groaning. He's groaning in his spirit. Why? He loves Martha and her heart's broken. He loves Mary and she's crying. He loves Lazarus and he's dead. And the wages of sin is death. And when you go to the funeral of a loved one, it tears you up. There's nothing that, nothing that gets to us like looking at those caskets and watching those, those bodies being lowered down into the ground. That's God at every funeral. His, his beloved dies, buried in the ground. Other people that he loves are weeping, crying, their hearts are broken. They've got to go home and try to console each other. You know what the Lord said? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked that he die. Not godly ladies that sing in church. Not dedicated men who work bus ministries. The wicked. God says, when the wicked dies, it tears my heart. He's afflicted. The Bible says in an earlier verse, look at verse number four. Surely he hath borne our griefs, our griefs and carried our sorrows. You know what that is? We, listen, we're, we're, this thing's way bigger than Christ dying for our sins. This thing is way bigger than Christ being punished for our iniquities. Let me tell you, t t t last night was New Year's Eve. Somebody, somebody last night got in a car under the influence of the devil's alcohol. And he got drunk because he took the first drink. So the first drink is wrong. Because without the first drink, he'd never been drunk. And he got in that car and he headed home and he crossed that center line and he took out somebody's mother. He took out somebody's wife. He took out somebody's child. You know what that is? That's a sin. Jesus had to pay for that sin. But you know what else he took to that cross? He took all the grief and sorrow of those children growing up without their mother. He took all the grief and sorrow of that man who lost his wife of those parents who had to see their, their daughter die before they did. I'm telling you, it's not just sin that messed up this world. It's all the results of everybody's sin banging into everybody else's results of sin. I got a good life. I got a great life. But this world stinks. You... You couldn't have a better family than I've got. You couldn't have a better church than I get to pastor. You couldn't be as old as I am and have better health than I've got. You couldn't have better opportunities. Your life couldn't be any more comfortable than my life is. And I want the rapture to happen now. Because you can't get through an hour without seeing somebody's sorrow and somebody's grief, even if they're not sinning. Just this world's just messed up. You pastors stand up to preach and you're preaching the Bible and, and part of your brain's on the Bible and part of your brain's on, this is the third week in a row that seat's been empty. I wonder where he is. 
There's sorrow and grief while we're preaching about the coming of the Lord. You get where you stand in the water and you, you're baptizing somebody and something inside you is saying, I wonder how many weeks before they disappear. They're like, like Enoch. Baptizing when they were not, for the Lord took them. You know, so <laughs> they were here, now they're gone. Then there's the actual unspeakable suffering of the trial and crucifixion. A blindfold on the face, your hands are bound, and a professional soldier in the prime of life to show off for his friends, hits you as hard as he can in the jaw. And then another one steps up to outdoing, and he hits you as hard as he can right in the teeth. And another one steps up to outdo him, and he gives you a roundhouse right to the temple, and they just stood there and beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. And he is in a body of flesh like yours. If it got hungry, if it got thirsty, if it got sleepy, it hurt. And they beat him. And then they put those thorns, they wrapped that crown of thorns around his head and they took a rod and they beat his head. They beat his head and they beat his head and they drove those nails into his sacred brow. And it hurt. And they took a whip and they plowed his back until his spine and his ribs and his organs can be seen. You say, I think a man would die of, of any of those would kill you. Yeah, if you weren't God, they'd kill you. If you weren't, if you weren't eternal life, they would kill you. But nobody could kill him. He had to lay down his life and die. But it doesn't mean it didn't hurt. And you put the nail in the palm or in the wrist or halfway up the arm. I don't care. I'm not going to argue with you about it. But when they drive nails through your hands and drive nails through your feet and then hang you up and the weight of your body is tugging against those nails, that is excruciating pain. They tore his beard out by the roots. They drove a spear up into his side. He was afflicted. And he did all that so I wouldn't have to go to hell. Yeah. And he did all that so you wouldn't have to go to hell. He got nothing out of it. And then came the eventual cup. And he drank that cup. And when those lights went out, as we heard earlier, the Father came down to Calvary. You'll read about it in the verses tomorrow. And the Father bruised him. And the wrath of Almighty God against all sin of all men for all time was poured out on that cross. If God and he could, if God and he did, could condense my suffering in hell and then the lake of fire forever and forever and forever, if God could condense that into one horrific blow, he did, and he struck Jesus Christ with that. And then yours, 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 and the, and the billions of people who would walk this earth. The God who made every atom, the God who formed every planet, the God who hung the sun, moon, and stars, the God that made all those birds and all those fish, the God, the God with that wisdom and that power used it all to afflict his son on the cross. So when he set you free, it wouldn't be unjust because somebody could say, well, they were supposed to suffer forever. He put forever into three hours at Calvary. And Jesus suffered it all. And that's not even the message of the verse. Brother Travis said, we just throw out that, that verse, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'm, I'm going to take you in your mind to that same verse. And I want to show you how 
impossible it would be for you to measure up to the glory of God. Try to think of all or one of the items we just mentioned under he was oppressed and put yourself there. Not for your lifetime, for one time. Try to take of all the affliction we talked about or one example of that affliction and put yourself there, not for your lifetime, for one time. Now watch this. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet, here's the marvel, he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb so he openeth not his mouth. Do you want to see the glory of God on display? With every unreasonable demand that was heaped upon Jesus Christ for 33 and one half years, not one time did he ever complain. Not one time did he ever say this is not fair. Not one time did he ever say, I don't deserve this. Not one time did he ever say, why, God, why? I can't do that one afternoon of my life. If you set out right now and said, I'm not going to complain about anything from between now and time I go to sleep, you won't make it. We come to a meeting like this, People giving us free food every two or three hours. Great musicians, you don't have to pay a dime for it. Preaching, singing, fellowship. Praise God, hallelujah, wave our hands, shed a few tears, shout a little bit, get touched in our hearts. Yeah, it was kind of long. I didn't like the second guy. I don't like sitting on that side. The lights were bright. The lights were dim. It was hot. It was cold. We can't endure anything. They just had this Christmas thing. Y'all heard of that? They had this, this Christmas thing. People are already unhappy with what they got. The stores are as busy after Christmas as they are before with people taking back what they got. Just give me 50 bucks. Let me get what I want. Don't guess. (laughs) You don't know me that well. (laughs) We've got it better materially than any people that ever lived in the history of the world. Some of you lived through the Depression. My mother and father lived through the Depression. You're not poor. The poorest person here is not poor. There aren't millions of people. Mexico don't need a wall. Nobody's going south out of Texas. They don't have an illegal immigration problem in Honduras. I've been to the Florida Keys many times. Nobody's building rafts hoping to make it to Cuba. What do you think about all these illegals? I think it means we live in the greatest nation on earth. It don't stop us from griping all day long. You know what conservative talk radio and liberal political TV is? It's 24 hours a day of griping. That's what it is. You know what church people do when they get together? They gripe. Aches, pains, pastor church members, God. You know what Jesus did? He was oppressed in every possible way a human being can be oppressed for the duration of his life and never opened his mouth about it. That's pretty amazing. And he went to that cross and they, in, in the courtroom, they lied about him. And the judge knew they were lying. He says, why don't you say something? 
The judge couldn't believe he wouldn't say anything. He opened not his mouth. I believe that centurion, when he said truly this was the son of God, it's because he'd never watched a man die without blaming everybody, without crying for mercy, without screaming he was framed or innocent. He just stood there and watched like, when's he going to say something? And he never did. You don't know how far short you come of the glory of God? Just take note of every time you complain about your oppression or your affliction. And there's no sorrow like this sorrow. There's no pain like this pain. There's no grief like this grief. There's no sorrow like this sorrow. And Jesus never uttered a word until he took my place and became sin for me. And when the Father saw me instead of Jesus, he turned his back. And only then did Jesus say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if the father had answered, he would have said, I'm not forsaking you, I'm forsaking them. Because you've become then and I can't look on sin. And down came that wrath and down came that wrath and down came that wrath on my sins and his body on the tree. But as soon as Jesus said it is finished, the sun came back on and the Father rent a veil, shook the earth and escorted the soul of his beloved Son to the lower parts of the earth and gave him the keys of death and hell. And 72 hours later, God raised him from the dead. Alive forevermore. What an amazing thing that he came down here and was oppressed without a complaint, without a murmur. You know, when the Lord points to the sin that drove him to destroy the entire generation of Israelites in the wilderness, you know what it was for? It was not for the golden calf. It was not for the naked dancing. It was not for the idolatry. It was for murmuring. God said, if I want to destroy every last one of you, I wouldn't have to take any, I wouldn't have to make any greater charge against you than you're a griper. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, we go out preaching, bless God, I'm not drinking that dr those drugs, that adultery. That's easy. That's easy, because most of us either never did that or got rid of it as soon as we got saved. Yeah. Who's quit griping? Yeah. Nobody I know. Who's quit complaining? It's, it's so much a part of us. We have to be told to be thankful. We have to be give, be give verses about thanksgiving. We have to have sermons preached at us about thanking God. Nobody has to say, and don't forget to complain. Just keep a balance. <laughs> The fact that Jesus Christ could be oppressed and afflicted and not open his mouth is the last, it's the last great trial before he is an acceptable sacrifice. You want to see it? Come to, come to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Before he can offer himself without spot, without blemish to God the Father as our sacrifice. Watch the order here. It lines up. It lines up with Isaiah 53. Verse number 19, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Isn't that the lamb in Isaiah 53? Yeah. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? That's all of us. You might not be suffering for what you did just then. 
But you did something. I don't know why this is happening to me. Well, you're not thinking too well. I can give you some reason. You want some reasons? I'll give you some. But if when ye do well, that's Jesus for 33 and a half years. And he's the only one that could fit in that verse. If you do well, and when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Is he going to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Only if he takes the oppression and the affliction patiently. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, praise the Lord, but look what's on par with doing no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. It's as hard to stop complaining as it is to stop sinning. In fact, it's easier to stop sinning than stop complaining. Well, you know, I don't go to the places I used to go, but I, I sure wish the good Lord hadn't made it so hard. Well, you know, I forgave that guy, but I, if he ever does that again, I, I, I didn't want to. But Even when we don't sin, we can find a way to complain about not sinning. But here's Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, that's somebody using their mouth against you. Reviled not again. There's not a person in here knows how to do that. Well, he, he said, you, you know what he said to me? <laughs> so all of a sudden it's okay for me to unload because he said something. Jesus never did. When he suffered, he threatened not, that's with his mouth, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And the sentence continues, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. You know what that is? It's Isaiah 53. He's oppressed, he's afflicted, can he go die for my sins? Not just yet. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and like a lamb, brought to, like a sheep brought to the slaughter, he openeth not his mouth. And it's as if the Father said, you just passed the last great test that nobody else could ever pass. And when he took the oppression and the affliction of man and God without reviling, without complaining, without threatening, God the Father said, that's an acceptable sacrifice. Bring it on. Listen. You've done things for your husband or your wife because it was right. But you had some things to say about it. You have provided for your children as you should. But you've let them know how inconvenient it was. <laughs> and you pastors, you may not tell your congregation how they're wearing you out, but you'll call me and tell me. <laughs> And the only reason every preacher hadn't quit is because what you guys say to each other about the preacher, you don't tell him all of it. I'm telling you, we don't know how to not open our mouth when we're being sheared, much less slaughtered. You know why he did? Because he didn't just do this because it had to be done. He did it because he wanted to. Nobody made him do it. He wasn't put out by it. He wanted to. 
Isn't that incredible? Mm -mm -mm. This sheep had gone astray. That sheep said, butcher me if that's what it takes to bring that one back. And I'll not complain about it because I want him back. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior. Father in heaven, we have no idea how oppressed Jesus was. We have no idea how afflicted Jesus was. But to see that he did all that without a murmur, without a complaint, the submission to your will, the love for our souls that's manifest in his silence is so humbling. It's so overwhelming. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to die in our place. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. The pastors here, the musicians are coming, the altars. Are...